Qualcomm. This is July the 10th, 2022. I'm with Ashan Putadamo. He's the abbot of the Arrow River Forest Hermitage near Thunder Bay, Northern Ontario. And we're with Panabasa in Southern Carolina. We're going to talk about Paticha Samupala. So we'll start with uh, Panabasa. You can define, tell the audience what that means. All right. Well, I can, I can start anyway, if, if I can. <laughs> but uh, Paticha Samupala, it has lots of different English renderings. I usually call it dependent co-arising. It can be condition, genesis, or there, there's lots of different terms for it. And it's, it was considered to be central to Buddhist philosophy. Like there's one sutta where the Buddha says, you know, if you, if you see Dhamma, you see Paditya Samupada, or if, I, maybe the Ajahn is more familiar with the sutta. He remembers it better, baby. This, maybe it's even if you see me, you see Paditya Samupada. It's, it's something where he's, he's putting Paditya Samupada just right in the center of, of Dhamma. And I think it and, was, if you see Paditya Samupada, you see the Dhamma. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it was, there's that. But on the other hand, according to the legend, the Buddha almost remained silent and didn't teach Dhamma. You know, he almost became what would be like a, a Pacheka Buddha. Because he had this idea, nobody would understand it. Hmm. And then Brahma had to come down from heaven to implore him to, to teach it. And then he looked and said, okay, there are some people with little dust in their eyes that, that may understand it. But there is uh, some wisdom to that because it does seem that Paditya Samupada has been very difficult to understand. And I think most Buddhists, even most Buddhist monks, really don't understand it. And um, it, that, that goes back towards the beginning where um, there's two different versions. You know, there's this being that is, you know, this, this existing that exists, you know, this ceasing that, or, you know, this not being that is not this ceasing that ceases. That's sort of like the short formula. And then you've got a longer formula, which apparently underwent some evolution. Like in uh, the Diga Nikaya, you've got the Nidana Sutta, which is the longest discourse on Paditya Samupada, and it doesn't follow the orthodox sequence. There, there's some differences. And there are some other suttas where there's like uh, the central portion of the, the Sakapana Sutta is sort of like a proto Paditya Samupada. There's another sutta in the, the Sutta Nipata called the. Uh, uh, what is it called? Kalahawiwada Sutta, which also has a kind of proto, you know, that because of this, there is that, because of that, there is this, you know, there's this sequence of causes and effects. And apparently they settled on what's called the 12 Nidana theory. Um, but still, it's like Buddhist, like monks in, in Myanmar, they'll just memorize these 12 links and then they think they understand Paditya Samupada. And mm -hmm. even... The, the 12 links were established, you know, long, long ago before the schism started. So, but there's still different interpretations of the 12 links. Like Theravada says, these 12 links refer to three different lives. You know, there's the past life, which leads to this life. And then it's the, you know, the craving in this life and it causes the, the clinging, which causes the bawa or the, the, like the karma, the momentum that leads to jati in the next life. Whereas other schools, I think the, I think it might have been the Saravasti Vadans had it all being with regard to one life. And then there have been some Theravadans like uh, the notorious Nyanavira who was saying that they're all simultaneous. Right. So it's, it's still controversial. It's still not very well understood. And personally, I think that uh, the one famous monk who understood dependent core rising better than any other was Venerable Nagarjuna who wasn't even a Theravada Buddhist. Hmm. And uh, I'm glad that the Ajahn mentioned Nagarjuna in a, in a previous talk, because uh, I do think that he really understood just the subtleties of it better than uh, the, like the commentators, like uh, Buddha Gosa or somebody like that. Hmm. So that's, that's one reason why I wanted to discuss this, um, especially in a conversation, including the Ajahn, just because it's, it's so central to understanding Dhamma, or mm. at least the the metaphysical or the the philosophical aspect of it, but at mm. the same time, it's it's so obscure and almost nobody really understands it, and, and that goes back to early times. Mm. So I'm just kind of tossing it out there to see what uh, kind of ideas we come up with. 
Yeah, it certainly is a, a, a subject that's been subject to uh, interpretation. It, uh, I, I like to say facetiously that there's only two topics that I've seen monks uh, get somewhat heated in, in debating each other. One is uh, Paticca Samapada and the other is the allowability of cheese in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when I was a monk, we debated that in 1996, and we 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 didn't have cheese in my monastery. <laughs> okay. um, and you you didn't mention in your summary there of uh, uh, Ajahn Buddha Dasa, uh, oh. Thai, Thai Thai monk who had a quite a bit of influence, and his interpretation of Bhatichas Mapada has um, is, is gotten a lot of followers because he he puts it he he puts it all into one one life and the moment uh, momentary sequence that's repeating constantly like moment by moment um i think if you uh you know talking about the topic the first the first thing is that general formula that you mentioned this arising that arises this ceasing that ceases i think that's a absolutely critical importance as a foundation stone for Buddhist thinking is the principle of causality, that things arise according to causes and conditions and not otherwise, that there's no randomness and there's no arbitrariness in existence. Yeah. So, so that, that uh, is the refutation of both eternalism and annihilationism. And the dependent origination is said by the Buddha to be the middle path between the two extreme views. Uh, and you're quite uh, right to point out that within the Sutta Pitaka, we have different variations. Uh, certainly the, um, the 12 Nadanas is the predominant one that occurs most often. And the, the interpretation is laid out in the Vastudhimaga over the three lifetimes, the past, uh, which is actually more than three lifetimes. It's like the past, past lives, plural, and then present life and future lives. Um, this generally just called the three life interpretation that does seem to be the one most uh, amenable to the plain meaning of the text in the suttas uh, that uh, because of uh, because of ignorance uh, we blunder it's like blundering around in the dark and knocking things over we disturb the universe with our actions those some cars and then consciousness is conditioned by that. And it's right in the text that this, this is patisandhi vinyana, the re consciousness, consciousness that arises in the womb and then unfolds through the, uh, all the stages of um, uh, nama rupa, six sense bases. And then we have the, the, uh, the process that leads to further becoming, beginning with sense contact, then feeling, then craving, and clinging, uh, that's upadana. And that's an interesting one to talk about because the translation as clinging is um, maybe not really uh, completely accurate. Yeah. Um, it uh, it more literally means fuel. Yeah, or uptake. Yeah, uptake would be a good one. Uh, very um, that leads to becoming and then birth, sickness, old age, and death. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the, you know, the future results. So I think that's the, you know, that's the interpretation that I think is most plainly evident in the suttas. So I think that Buddha Das's momentary interpretation, uh, could also be, uh, without contradicting the, the first one, without contradicting the three lives interpretation, it could also apply. And certainly that, that part of the sequence between uh, contact, feeling, craving, that's the critical point of practice. That um, feeling is, uh, Vedana is the last resultant factor. We don't really have any control over our feelings. It's a result of previous kama. And then we have a sense contact due to previous kama. Then we have the feeling arising from that. But then how do we deal with that feeling? And that we do we allow craving to arise or not? And that's the first step in our comma making stages, the new new arising. 
And Buddha Dasa in his writings, he really emphasizes that point, that that's the, the critical point of practice. And I think that's the value of his particular interpretation. But I have encountered uh, some of his followers that I, I think have a less subtle understanding than he did. And it's, it's fairly common amongst people who consider themselves followers of Buddha Dasa to deny that rebirth occurs at all. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, encountered any of these people. I, didn't no, I think it's that. more of a Thai, a Thai thing. Possibly, yeah. I actually saw him in 1992. I did my first 10-day retreat there, and I read his book, The Handbook for Mankind. That's really what got me into Theravada Buddhism when I first... I didn't speak with him. He was just walking by his months before he died, you know. Yeah. I attended one talk he gave. I didn't understand enough Thai to follow his talk, but fortunately it was being translated. There was somebody translating his talk. We visited his monastery in my first year in Thailand and at listening to his talk, and he was very impressive figure you know and he had a very matter of fact way about him in his teaching and i remember his uh uh his repeated refrain, refrain was e kapai jayata it was kind of a thai thai poly thing meaning you know dependently arisen or born according to conditions and, and he was saying how everything in the world is e kapai jayata we uh, there's no reason to be attached to it it's yeah like there's there's one the one really subtle thing about it that i think a lot of people miss is everything is caused by other causes and conditions but yes. each of those causes and conditions is also likewise caused by a web of causes and conditions yes. so that really there is no self essence right any everything is just sort of a like an epiphenomenon of it's just these other causes around it or these conditions around it. And I think that's what Nagarjuna was talking about is Mula Majamaka Karaka, where it's just, he's saying that dependent core rising is emptiness, that they're yeah. the same. Yeah. And you could, you could toss in no self also with that. It's just, there's no self essence. It's just all, it's all conditional. You know, if this exists and that exists, it's, it's just all this conditional, you know, like, uh, just conditional reality. It's not like ultimately real. Right. That That's, yeah, that's an, that's an excellent and very important point that, that the idea of conditionality, uh, by contemplating conditionality, you, you approach the idea of emptiness because it, that, that's mm -hmm. one, that's way, one way of understanding sunyata, understanding emptiness is that nothing nothing has any self-substance nothing is intrinsically existent on its yeah. own the result of other things which themselves are results of other things and there's nothing that's nothing that can be pointed to as a self-sustaining substantial entity yeah there was no original condition that caused anything else it's just this yeah, yeah. it's just this web of mm -hmm. possibilities or something I want There's to ask about rebirth. How, Ashan, how could uh, Buddha uh, Dasa's followers think that there's not rebirth? Uh, well, the Buddha Dasa in his talks and writings always de-emphasized rebirth. And I take it from what I read in his, you know, because I've read several of his books. And I, I think he was not, he never denied the existence of rebirth. But I think he was playing to his audience that the culture of Thailand is so um, obsessed with getting a better rebirth. And he wanted people to think about getting Nibbana. So, you know, don't think about rebirth. Never mind rebirth. Oh, you know? I see. Yeah, he's trying to balance his culture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the Westerners, particularly taking his teaching up, they say, well, there is no rebirth. That's bad news for the Westerners. They get they yeah. getting misled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I've I've run into several, including a couple of monks, and you know, who consider themselves Buddha Dasa followers, who say, "Well, rebirth was just a myth; it doesn't really exist." Well, it seems to me that if a Buddhist who doesn't believe in rebirth, I mean, you believe that everything is dukkha, and there's no rebirth, and the obvious thing to do is just immediately commit suicide. Yeah, well, yeah, I I completely agree. It doesn't make any sense. To, you can't. I don't think you can possibly have Buddhism without rebirth. But there's a lot of people try to do it. 
you know, like karma and rebirth are the two things that you really have to believe to have a conviction about to be a Buddhist, I think, you know. Well, the yeah. Four Noble Truths are still true, regardless of whether there is rebirth. I mean, you know, craving is still, craving and attachment are the, still the cause of suffering, you know, right now. And now is the, the most important time. So, I mean, I, I could see one could be agnostic about rebirth. Just don't worry about it. Just, you know, attend to the present moment. But, um, yeah, yeah, it I, does. I think yeah. that was more a Buddha Dasa's actual point was like, the, don't concern yourself with rebirth. Don't worry about it. It's you know, something that happens or not. It's not, you know, what we got to practice in this moment. And we should be trying to realize the unconditioned. But then his followers took it a step further, and a lot of them deny rebirth altogether. They think they've come up with a system that that works without it. Yeah, there's. Um, I've I've always preferred the short version of Paricca Samuppada to the twelve Nidana version because it does seem to me that it was uh, like an artifact. It got cobbled together. You know, there are proto Paricca Samuppadas like. Uh, like I said earlier, the, the central part of the Sakapanya Sutta is very close in certain ways. Or the Kalaha Viwara Sutta also, although both of those seem to start with Papancha instead of, uh, yeah. instead of ignorance. And I think, it, I, I don't remember what the Nidana Sutta starts with. I think it's, it's, some, it's, it's not the, the usual beginning. Yeah, it's... Um, uh, like ignorance and Namarupa kind of causing each other oh, and then it spins Vinyana, off the... Vinyana and Namarupa. I oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And that they, they like uh, play off each other. Yeah. Namarupa is the cause of Vinyana. Vinyana is the cause of Namarupa. Yeah. And then Namarupa itself is, is can be controversial in that uh, it's come to be interpreted just as mind and matter. Although... Yeah, yeah. Like in the Upanishads, it's it's almost like Papancha Sankha, where Nama is like the, the name of things, Rupa is the form of it, mm. where it could just be a psychological phenomenon. But getting back to the 12 Nidana theory, it's always, it seems, first of all, there's like a short circuit, because there's two different terms in the 12 Nidana theory that mean the same thing. You've got uh, Sankara and also Bawa, both just mean Kama. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of causes a short circuit where you could just skip the whole central portion. But uh, yeah, I, also, it does seem to me that uh, they should have another link after Vedana, between Vedana, between sensation or feeling and craving. I mean, there should be like sanya or something, some kind of yeah, sanya process. Of that's, what, that's occurred to me too, that sanya ought to be for completeness it would seem to be in there but i think yeah. there is a diff i think there is a, a difference between bawa and sankara although they're close i, I see sankara as being uh, the act of making of kama and bawa is more like upaka it's more like the result of kama that you're coming into being because of upadana is the fuel for becoming and then you come into existence so you're back into resultant kama there you're coming into existence in one of the three uh three realms depending yeah, on i've always interpreted bova as just the force of existence just kind of the momentum that's fueled by the upadana yeah yeah but it's not it's i guess the difference is one is karmically active and one's karmic resultant oh, okay yeah, they're supposedly both in signifying karma or kama. But, uh... Well, the whole thing, the whole 12 Nadanas is, in, in, in essence, a, a commentary on the process of kama vipaka. Yeah. So still, I do, I do tend to prefer Nagarjuna's, uh, his uh, centrism or Majamaka middle way or whatever I, I do think that he really came close to what the buddha was trying to teach and that it got misunderstood very early um even even no self you know just the very fact that there are different canonical explanations for it different ways of explaining it indicates that it was difficult to understand mm -hmm. so I, th I think dependent core rising is just it's just the classic it's considered to be essential to dhamma well, at the same time, almost nobody really understands it. And most people who think they understand it have just memorized, you know, a list of words. Yeah. And they still don't really understand it. Yeah. Yeah, it is, as the Buddha said to Ananda, you know, Ananda said this, 
this teaching is profound and deep and uh, you know uh, i understand it and we said no you 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 shouldn't say that it's, it's you know you yeah that's so and ended uh what was i gonna say um yeah i th i think that that is like you mentioned earlier i think that is the critical point is the seeing um seeing it as a as a way of understanding emptiness and yeah it does explain a lot in buddhism yeah um the whole uh hua yen school of buddhism is centered on that that concept of the interdependence of things and they and they, they have some really um powerful uh imagery that they use like indra's net you're familiar with that this the the net in in the, the god indra's palace he has an a, as a decoration there's this net it's like a three-dimensional weave and at each intersection there is a jewel and in each jewel is multifaceted and in every facet of every jewel the entirety of the net is reflected including that jewel and its facet so it's like an infinite regress you keep boring into it yeah yeah I, i've heard i've read a, a similar one just about, about mirrors set up so that uh you know that every other mirror is reflected in each one yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that that that's that's another one that um uh i think they actually built built it in china it was a like a hall that was a cube every face was a mirror and you sit in the middle of it and see infinite regresses in all directions i thought i, I thought i'd like to build one myself one of those <laughs> yeah yeah when i was a kid it was just a barber shop it had mirrors on both walls yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 I, I remember things like that <clears throat> but that's uh, you know the uh the Baticha Pan Sanmopade is certainly really central. Then there's the um, the Upanisa Sutta. That's uh, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi calls it the transcendental dependent arising. That's another variation that spins off from it takes this the standard twelve nidana as far as uh, Bawa, but instead of going on to birth, sickness, old age, and death, it just clumps them all together as dukkha. And then it, it shows a way out because then from dukkha you get uh, sada faith and then from that you get pamoja uh, joy and then it goes through you know several intermediate stages to um, uh, nibida niroda uh, viraga uh, vimuti so it's like a, a dependent origination the 12 madana is entirely samsara right but this this is a, like a, a picture of samsara but this is a also includes the path out to nibbana yeah just the very fact that there are several different versions of the this this conditions that that conditions that does indicate that this there could be a, a certain amount of arbitrariness with regard to uh the actual you know settling on the 12 the 12 mm. links mm. and that's um i don't know if you've read it but uh it was really important for me in understanding buddhism is uh studies in the origins of buddhism by gc Pandey. oh i don't not familiar with that oh uh, it's, it's it's an excellent book and he that was his theory also that uh that um it was the the 12 nidana theory was essentially just cobbled together you know it, it was just sort of evolved over the first you know several decades or so of of early buddhism mm -hmm. uh, partly just because people had such difficulty in understanding the whole idea because it was so subtle and and profound mm. Mm. another point i think to make is that uh, whatever version of the sequence we take whether it's the standard 12 madana or the one in the diga or any of the other ones it is in essence a simplification and uh, because um there's there's a principle that's stated explicitly in in one of the abhidhamma texts that um nothing arises without a cause and nothing arises from a single cause so to take uh 
it has a kind of like chain of dominoes. So a causes B causes C causes D. That is, uh, it's not wrong, but it's a simplification. It's, yeah. it's, it's leaving out multiple other factors that go into every occurrence. Yeah, well, that reminds me of just the, the beginning of Nagarjuna's book, the Mula Majamaka Karika, where he's, he's dealing with the issue, is the cause the same as the effect? Or is it different from the effect? And, you know, he uses, you know, early Indian logic to pretty much disprove all the possibilities of yes, no, yes, and no, and neither yes nor no. Yeah. Because if, if the cause is the same as the effect, then there's no, there should be no change. If the cause is different, then it's, it's, uh, it should just arise spontaneously without the, the need of the cause, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Well, that's it is. I do think that that one book by Nagarjuna is uh, about the best. It, it it has helped me to understand the whole concept of dependent co-arising, and I do think that the the Sam in Samupada can mean like you know arising together. I mean, Sam usually you know it corresponds to Latin con or or Greek you know S Y N sin. It means you know usually means together, although um, sometimes it's taken as just an intensifier, like, you know, Sam Buddha, Sama Sam Buddha, or something like that. Mm. But in this case, I do think it could mean that it's supposed to be something simultaneous. As uh, Ajahn, or uh, Venerable Nyanavira used to say, it says, you know, this arising, that arises, not this ceasing, that arises. Mm. Yeah. But like I said, like I say, it's like it's very difficult to understand, put, or at least to put into words. Maybe there's this intuitive comprehension in the arahant that uh, you don't have to try to explain it. Maybe that's why um, he couldn't explain it clearly enough that it really was clearly understood by you know most of his followers. Maybe that's why Pacheca Buddhas just keep their mouths shut. Yeah. <laughs> What, is there any uh, guided meditation on this or any way to really contemplate upon it, get a deeper realization? Um, there is the Mogok method in Burma where mm -hmm. um, one of the main meditations is you just listen to uh, a recording of Mogok Seattle going over the 12 Nidana theory of mm -hmm. Padicca Samupada. And they've got the big wheel, like oh, the wow. big diagram. It's almost like a mandala yeah. where it's, you know, it's talking <laughs> about the, the different stage but they take they interpret it just very literally it's, it's oh. the 12 nidanas and the, the commentarial explanation and so forth oh so they yeah. listen to that and they contemplate upon that get some realization when when i was in thailand in my early days as a monk and i i, I was wrestling with trying to understand Pitya samapada and uh, what i was doing is on my walking meditation i would take one nidana at a time for a you know, for one back and forth of the walk and contemplate it and try to, particularly with the emphasis on trying to understand the links in between the two, like how does Sankara cause Vinyana, you know, and this is sort of, and trying to approach it not so much from an intellectual understanding, but to see if I could intuitively grasp it. You know, so that, um, I think with those, these sorts of, of teachings that you, you've got to, You've got to get beyond just trying to figure it out. Yeah. And, and try to uh, intuit it, you know. And then you can come back from that and try to put it into words and explain it to yourself or to others. But to really understand that you've got to, it's more, it's more an intuitive or you know, it's a right brain grasping of it that, that's important. I do think it's interesting that some of the versions of the the series of links starts with papancha or papancha sankha yeah instead yeah. of uh just ignorance or some such yeah yeah there there are these different slight variations that uh, you know are all you know because of, because of that thing that, that I I mentioned that nothing arises from a single cause these um, different uh, sequences don't really contradict each other. They're they're emphasizing different points or aspects. Yeah, but it is interesting, and uh, I don't know if, what 
what this I, I assume there is no solution to the uh the difficulty of the subject no less but as you said that uh, arahant that might be the solution <laughs> yeah just stop trying to figure it out and just practice yeah yeah well, like you said on uh the buddha warned in nana no it's not easy to understand it. <laughs> and it's very deep and then it's not easy to understand this yeah yeah I guess, can we go any further than that? I don't have much to add to that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I would just uh, recommend that anyone with the uh, patience and the intelligence to read it should, I mean, you can you can get benefit from reading uh, Nagarjuna's yeah. Mula Majamaka Karaka. There are uh, a few English translations of it out there. Oh, is it on Amazon? Probably, yeah. Probably, yeah. Okay. I think I've got a copy right here that I haven't. It's on my reading list. I haven't gone through it. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, I'll never, I don't know, I'm not going to bother trying to find it. <laughs> yeah. But one of the most important verses in there is the one where he's just saying, by by Padicca Samupada, we mean emptiness. By emptiness, we mean Padicca Samupada. Mm. And uh, Nagarjuna wasn't really a Mahayana Buddhist that I'm aware of. He was just that he was a. Uh, like a pre Mahayana Buddhist of a different sect than Theravada who yeah. came up with this interpretation of, of emptiness and so forth. And the Mahayana Buddhists liked it. So they just kind of adopted him as a patriarch. Yeah, they he never mentions it. any Mahayana texts. He's mainly mentioning like uh, the Kachiyana Sutta and a few of these other obscure kind of difficult to understand paradoxical kind of suttas that are found in the Pali texts. Although he was going with the Sanskrit version of it. Oh, okay. So you're saying he was not a Mahianas, but the Mahianas have uh, adopted him today. Uh, yeah, probably. Or yeah. if he was a Mahayana Buddhist, he concealed it fairly well and didn't refer to bodhisattvas or uh, ah. any Mahayana texts. So he probably wasn't, right? He's probably just adopted after his death. Yeah, I, yeah. I assume he was just adopted as a patriarch, just like Mahakasapa was adopted as a Mahayana <laughs> patriarch and Zen. so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, should we wrap it up at this point? Yeah, okay. Might as well. Okay, thank you, Ashan. Thank you, Panabasa.